It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is the Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, horror and sci-fi author, John Crinan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 56 of Great Writer Share, the podcast where every week we grab an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around to join us on the show and discuss their approach to the craft of writing, publishing, and staying creative in today's chaotic world. It is the 4th of October as I record this, so let's dive into my personal update. My big news over the last month is that I've delivered my part of the epic week-long Halloween event that's happening over on Hawk and Cleaver's The Other Stories podcast. Uh, I have a short story in there, and in actual fact, my guest this week is also contributing a story. So we go into a little more information about this in our discussion that's coming up, but we don't give you any spoilers, don't worry. I'm personally very excited about this project because the Halloween podcast is going to be hosted by British horror icon Emily Booth. Now, if you are not a horror movie fan, then maybe that name might not be familiar to you. But I've been a huge fan of Emily's work for years. And the fact that I'm getting to work alongside her on a project like this is really genuinely a dream come true. Quick plug, if you want to... Stay tuned to the Hawk and Cleaver social channels. You can find out more. And the first episode of the Halloween special will drop on Sunday, the 25th of October. So quite soon. I'm very excited for everyone to hear it. Okay, back to Great Writer Share. And we have some news. The winner of this month's giveaway is Mark McClure. He has won Holly Lines Gold Setting for Writers. Congratulations, Mark. Coming up, this month's giveaway will be Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. Patrons are automatically entered, and those on the Facebook group have a chance to get involved by commenting on the post and answering the question, are you a plotter or a pantser? So get on over to Facebook or Patreon to be in with a chance of winning. And more news, our very own Daniel Wilcox will be running a NaNoWriMo boot camp throughout the month of November, in which he'll be doing live Zoom sprints with writers who want to reach the 50,000 words mark by the end of the month. Writers who sign up will be invited into live sprints every Tuesday and Thursday between 8pm and 9.30pm GMT. You will also get to ask any questions in a live Q&A and have the option to receive weekday text reminders from Dan to motivate and inspire you to conquer NaNoWriMo and reach the finish line. If you want to find out more, all information for the bootcamp can be found at danielwilcox.com forward slash bootcamp. A big thank you to everyone who answered the question of the week this week as posted on our Patreon and Facebook. The question we asked was, what is your daily writing goal? And responses were all across the board. Me personally, my own target is 500 words, or as I like to put it, just two crappy pages a day. But a selection of the other answers we received Harley aims for 2,000 words per day or a completed scene or chapter. And that was something I saw in a few answers. Yanni Jade agrees and also aims for a complete scene when she sits down for a day's writing. Faye Trask gets up at 5 a.m. and aims for 600 words. I'm a big fan of a 5 a.m. start. Nice work, Faye. Meg Jolly currently achieves 3,000 words per day but is aiming to get that up even higher to 5,000. And finally, Ian J. Middleton, rather than aiming for a specific word count, he instead will sit down to write for a specific amount of time, an hour per day. And I think that's a great way to look at the daily target because sometimes but in chair time can be so much more important than just the number of words that you get down. So I like that a lot. I can't include everyone's answer here, but thanks to everyone who contributed. Today's guest is writer Ben Errington, and we discuss beginning a new writing project cover first, gaining confidence as a writer, and the importance of positivity on social media, plus tons more. 
But before we get into the show, we wanted to remind you about our Patreon community over at patreon.com forward slash great writer share, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get involved in our behind the scenes group, benefiting from early ad free access to episodes of the show, joining in our private Slack channel, asking upcoming guests any of your questions, and getting involved in our monthly giveaways. So if you like the idea of upping your author career and getting all that good stuff, then one more time, that's patreon.com forward slash great writers share. And now, without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one and only Ben Errington. Ben Errington is a writer, podcaster and designer from Bristol in the UK. His books include Ten Tales of the Human Condition, the novella Die Pack and The Nest, which both myself and fellow Great Writer Share host Daniel Wilcox had the pleasure of collaborating on too. He co-created the post-apocalyptic luchador comic book El Marvel, which was successfully funded through Kickstarter, and alongside Luke Condor, who was a previous guest on Great Writer Share too, he hosts the horror movie discussion podcast Horror Hangout. Ben is a member of the storytelling collective Hawk and Cleaver and one of the minds behind the hugely successful fiction podcast The Other Stories. He designs book covers, he sings, he's an occasional Twitch streamer and a whole lot more besides. I don't know if we'll even scratch the surface in the hour or so that we have together here today, but Ben, welcome to the show. Hello, John. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. We have been, uh, we were talking just before we hit record. Me and you have been talking about jumping on a podcast, some podcast together for a long time. And it just hasn't happened. But today, tonight is the day that it's finally happening. So it's, it's very exciting. The stars have aligned. We're both free. How wonderful. <laughs> Let's make some <laughs> magic together. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so while I was preparing for this chat, because I did do some preparation and I was looking through some of the, the stuff that you've worked on, I stumbled across a pretty lovely find. It's, a, it's almost a perfect find, I think, for when you're researching a potential guest. And I wonder if you remember it because it's very fresh wow. in my mind because I just listened to it. But a long time ago, in April 2015, you... Uh, appeared on a podcast called Luke's Massive Storytelling Podcast Thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. And 20, when was it? 2015? April 2015, according to my podcast app. Yes. Yeah. And on that episode, uh, you spoke to Luke Condor, who I mentioned in the in the intro as well, and longtime listeners of Great Writer Share will recognize him from an early episode. Uh, but you joined the podcast and you were doing something that he was doing on that show at the time, which was seven day story challenges. Yes. He had done a couple of seven day sto story challenges or seven day challenges. Actually, I should say he had done he, he had written a, a, a short story and published it uh, onto Kindle all within seven days. He made a short film and released that all within seven days. And then you joined as I think the fourth person or the fourth challenge. And you wrote and published a short story on Kindle in seven days as well. And I was just yes. wondering if you can cast your mind back to that time. Was that your uh, was that was that you starting to become a published writer? That was your first published yeah. work, right? That was that was the very first thing I published. Um, I had a couple of things in mind of stuff I wanted to publish, stuff I've been working on. But I think the thing I was lacking at that time was the know-how, just the know-how of how to do everything. I kind of knew, okay, well, if I've got a story or a book, what can I do with it? I had absolutely no idea about self-publishing. I had no idea about publishing on Kindle. And I think I was just scrolling through various podcasts, um, trying to find something that could kind of give me that information. I think I remember what, looking at looking at a lot of stuff on YouTube and I'm not entirely sure how it happened because I always try and remember how did it happen. I don't know if I just put into podcasts storytelling or writing or what. Because Luke's podcast was only like a few episodes old. As you yeah. say, maybe maybe this was, yeah. 
And uh, there was something about his voice. I just trusted him. From the, <laughs> moment, from the moment I heard him, I just trusted him. And it was a bit like, okay, this guy knows something that I don't. And I think that's kind of what draws you to various podcasts is that you're just listening because you believe the hosts have got this knowledge and you want a bit of it. You want a bit of that knowledge pie. And he's and he's giving it out for free. You know, he's giving out the knowledge pie for free. He and is dishing slice. out slices. Yeah, he is dishing out loads yeah. of slices in that podcast. It's a lovely find because it's really you appeared on the podcast twice or at least maybe maybe more but i i listened to two earlier I today twice yeah i think there was like a one day was the set setting up of the challenge and the second day was like the how did you find the challenge thing and i think i just dropped him an email i think i listened to a couple of ep- episodes and saw that he was uh sorry heard that he was doing the seven day story challenge and i think even at that point my idea for the story was very very vague very vague i kind of wanted to write uh i think i was i've been watching a lot a lot of breaking bad and i was like i want to write a little crime short set like in and around new mexico and that was kind of it i didn't have any ideas of characters or anything that was going to happen so but i kind of needed this to set to set it in motion i needed to have something that was going to make me do it and what more pressure could i've put my up on myself than you're going to appear on a podcast twice before and after you do it to publish the first thing i'd ever published i needed that push yeah the public accountability is like the perfect way to 100%. do it i kind of still feel like i want to do that a lot the public accountability thing and sometimes i could probably say once or twice i've put someone out there and i've not followed through on it but i'd say almost all the time what if i've got something that i'm kind of halfway through or nearing finishing or sometimes even just begun i want to put something out there that like holds me publicly accountable that then i can eventually follow through on (laughs) i guess it just helps me in terms of my creative process the pressure I can totally understand that. And it absolutely worked in this case because like you said, the first t- time you appear is the moment before you start. You have an, you have an idea. I think you said in the, in the first episode that you have a synopsis. You've written a synopsis. And then a week yeah. later, there's a second appearance. You've done it. You've written it. Uh, it's out in the world. So you've got this great evidence that you can go back to. And it was a wonderful thing for me to listen to because it really does feel like, oh, this is, this is the moment when it all happened. This is it, the beginning. You know, yeah. This is when it, it started. Was, uh, it... I think Luke was really good throughout the week as well. Just um, asking me for my progress, answering any questions I had. I think I maybe ran one or two things past him as well. Um, I was really holding him as like right up on a pedestal as somebody that I was just holding on his every word. And I think I honestly really, really needed that because at this point in terms of collaboration with anything I'd written, it had all been stuff that I'd been just squirreling, squirreling away at on my own. I'd never, I don't think I'd even really told anybody at that at, at this point that I was a writer that I wanted to write. Um, so yeah, it was pretty exciting stuff at that time. I, I thought it was interesting actually, because you probably don't know this, but it's actually very scarily, eerily similar to how I got started writing as well. Because oh, really? I was, okay. yeah, I was like you, writing for, well, I'm, I'm not sure how long you were writing for before that uh, that recording happened, but I was writing for years before that happened, never really showing anyone it, never really doing anything with my writing, never finishing things either. And then... I became aware of Luke on a Facebook, a writing um, Facebook group. I think he shared one of his covers or something like that. And I commented on it, became, you know, uh, mutual followers of uh, Luke on various social media platforms. And then he, through Hawk and Cleaver, which we'll get to, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot. He started a seven day story writing group it was like a seven day horror writing group back in 2018 and uh i signed up for that and that was the first short story that i ever wrote and it ultimately went on to be published on 
the other stories. So that all happened in seven days as well. Not quite, you know, my failure wouldn't have been quite so public if I hadn't achieved it as yours p- had the potential to be. <laughs> I think I just wouldn't have gone on the second episode of the podcast. I would have just like, <laughs> I would have just like vanished into the shadows. Just been like, what? Yeah, that story. Ah, yeah, what? So I never heard of you, mate. Luke Condor, leave me alone. <laughs> But it's such a lovely thing because obviously anyone um, who's familiar with you or even anyone who's just listened to that intro, you and Luke are still friends now. You're still collaborating now. You're working on a bunch of stuff together. You have the Horror Hangout podcast. Um, Since it's such a perfect place to kind of start, there's so many things that we can talk about. But I'm just interested, since I've already cast your mind all the way back to April 2015, I'm imagining that Hawk and Cleaver, the, the other stories, they all followed on from that first meeting with Luke. Um, yeah. Can you talk us through the... Well, first of all, for anyone... I mean, I'm sure most people will, will know who Hawk and Cleaver is or have heard it on this podcast before because Dan is also a member of the, the collective. Um, but can you just explain what Hawk and Cleaver is and, and uh, when, after your appearance on the storytelling podcast did that all start coming together um so we've always described hawk and cleaver as a digital story studio and i think initially when we all came together we wanted just uh, an umbrella for us to start publishing our own books and short stories and various other things on and the idea of the other stories kind of followed on pretty soon after that after we came together i think <clears throat> after being on that podcast Luke's storytelling podcast thing. <laughs> that's that's the official title, isn't it? Yeah, it sounds like you don't remember what yeah. it's called, but that is actually what <laughs> <Yeah>. it's called. <laughs> that's the thing. I'm, prob- I'm probably going to slightly misremember all the Hawk and Cleaver stuff because it is a whirlwind. Like the last five years or so have been a whirlwind and there's been so much and so many different people we've collaborated with across the board, you know, stuff that Luke's worked on, stuff that Dan's worked on, Matt, Butcher, uh, myself, and then obviously the, the outer family as well, because I think that obviously even though there's a few of us as the key core members of Hawk and Cleaver, we've got like an outer family now, an outer ring, if you like. Outer ring or inner circle. Depends which you like the best, inner or outer, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, from there, it kind of just developed and it has been developing ever since. I can't, this is the thing. I think what happened was me and Luke after the podcast realized we had quite a lot in common music films uh comics various other things so we we're always chatting and i was still listening to the podcast so i was still working out what was going on and then i think something happened where i was in london and so we met each other for the first time in soho and i think then i think we just knew we're like yeah we're buddies now we're buddies not just like uh because as i said before i held him on a pedestal i was like i wanted all your knowledge and everything like that after that i realized okay He's got all that knowledge, but he's a he's a lovely guy as well. So uh, the respect just went right down after. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. So after that, um, I'm not sure. Somebody had the idea. I think it was Luke. I think it was a collaborative idea. Actually, I think everyone was kind of pitching different things um, about doing like a weekly podcast, a weekly short form fiction podcast, horror, science fiction, and the like. Something where we could essentially all write a story. Uh, a week of the month and then we'd have like four stories for every month uh yeah and then someone said why don't we do it by themes so obviously early days we had zombies aliens pretty standard stuff and it has just grown into a bit of a monster a bit of a monstrosity i guess but it's been lovely to kind of watch it grow because myself personally i'm i was very very involved in probably the first two years in terms of how many stories i was writing i think for the first year i wrote one every month and then the second year, probably one every two months. And now I kind of don't really turn up and write anything apart from once a year for Halloween, which I've kind of been doing the last couple of years. But it's great to just watch everybody kind of everybody come in and, and pitch in with stories. And now we've obviously got a great team of editors, narrators, um, writers. It's just it is kind of just insane. But it's kind of like providing that thing that we wanted something like that to be able to publish our own work. So we created that. And now we're kind of helping other writers publish their work um, in a similar way. 
Yeah. Which feels yeah. Good. And I, yeah, and I'm I'm grateful that you guys got together when you did because I would not be published otherwise. Um, oh, I, now. It, well, sure maybe eventually, would. eventually I would <laughs> yeah. have. That's what's interesting. I think you went from the seven day story challenge. You finished. Uh, I think it. I think you said it was a five thousand word story in that week. And then to go from. Obviously, the success of the of that seven day challenge to i'm not sure exactly how much time passed but you, you know it, it was relatively it was fairly quick I think. I think what happened was the end of that year i'd kind of been sitting on a sitting on a a, a novel which the, all the all the knowledge i got from die pack and publishing that on kindle um with luke's help i kind of applied that knowledge to then finish this novel i had get it edited get it all set up for, you know, to be officially printed via Amazon and put on Kindle and everything. So it kind of gave me the tools that I needed and also that extra push, that extra nudge in the right direction. And I think that happened, that was December 2015. And then I think the other stories maybe came about in March 2016. I think that was when we first went live around about then. I might be a little, I might be a little bit off, but it was pretty quick. Yeah, and it just shows you how amazing you can ride that that you know having a having an early win or or, or a quick win maybe however you want to describe it, then going on to finish a novel. How long had, how long had you been writing that novel for? Um, it had been a number of years, so I think initially it was something that I kind of wanted to make into a graphic novel. Because so I think in my very early idea of being a writer, I wanted to write graphic novels and comics. I hadn't really thought about anything in terms of prose. But it kind of just spiraled out of control. And then basically I was working in a, a telesales job and a telesales job that, you know, I, some afternoons were very barren, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of just had a, had a little Word document open and I was kind of just typing stuff. And, you know, that multiplied by however many months. In the end, I think I had something like 50,000 words. And I was a bit like, well, I wonder what this could be is this a book again i'd never written anything like that before i'd never published anything like that so that was kind of happening in the background while i met luke and everything so again that gave me the tools and eventually went on and published published a book i think that's um really impressive though i mean was luke reading the book as you went along or how did that work no 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 so um luke was kind of not really involved in that at all as I say, when when I published the short story, I had all the information. <clears throat> then I think I found out. I, I think Luke maybe put me on to a editor as well. As I said, he was pretty good. And I, I was asking him quite I was firing questions at him. Like uh and he was ever so calm, ever so polite, answered all my questions. Uh yeah, but it's I mean it sounds like overly romanticized, but I I don't know if I would have done any any of this without him. That's the thing. And I think the key to that is collaboration. For me, at least, I know I know it works for a lot of people as well. But collaboration for me has always been key in in pushing me forwards in terms of creation and writing. Yeah, and I guess that is exactly what happened with the other stories. And having the you had the you had the collaborative aspect. You also had uh the accountability aspect because there were four of you guys you each had to write the story a story a month and if one of you missed it you know there would have been a, a gap in that weekly release mm. schedule the amount the amount of uh messages I, I used to get from uh dan dan wilcox just saying have you written your story yet <laughs> me going, oh yeah i'm definitely definitely nearly finished i hadn't typed a word <laughs> i'm definitely nearly finished i think in those very initial days as well i mean imposter syndrome was running was running wild with me uh because you know you got you got luke condor obviously from the from the podcast he's the guy from the podcast you got dan wilcox you got matt butcher these are guys i don't know very well but you know luke's telling me that they're great writers and stuff i was like oh my god am i gonna be able to write so are they all gonna write wonderful stories and i'm gonna write like i don't know so am I just going to write something that won't stand up against it? I was really worried in the early days. But again, I think that was another thing. The collaboration and also that element, the imposter syndrome element, just really helped me to like up my game as well. 
And, you know, it's great when you eventually do work out that, okay, maybe my work can like stand up against all of these other writers. I know it's, it's hard to compare yourself to, to other, other writers who've got a completely different voice and uh, completely different way and method and of approaching things. But it felt good to just be like, okay, I've sent, I've sent this story and it hasn't come back with an immediate, absolutely not, that's terrible. Which kind of feels good, you know? And that was that was part of the confidence thing. I think that's what I needed. From that initial stage and that initial appearance on the podcast, confidence was pretty low, but I think it was low because I just didn't really know what I was doing. So as soon as as soon as I gained more knowledge, confidence went up, and then I think my standards kind of went up too. Which yeah. Which was handy. I think that is... Uh, it's so funny how you're... Obviously... You know, you've done so much and we're going to get to all of it. But it's so interesting for me to hear how your early years, if you like, have so many similar, feel so similar to kind of where I'm at now. I think I'm a few, like quite a few years back, but I'm in that kind of space right now where my early submissions, I just thought they were terrible. And I there was certain ones where I had uh, some friends who were, reading my stories and they were saying oh you should you know you should submit you should submit that to this call or whatever and I was like I I really don't think I should and it would get to the point where I would just kind of convince myself to hit send or or do it when I was at a moment's uh, at a moment's (laughs) weakness and then just hate myself for hitting send and then you know they would eventually go on and, and get um get picked up which was which was wonderful. And every new story, you do build that confidence. And when you're in such a supportive environment, um, because Hawk and Cleaver, you know, you guys have a, have a kind of behind the scenes Slack channel, which I'm lucky enough to be a part of. And it's such a supportive, creative environment. There's like 20 individuals in there, a lot of them writers, but there's uh, narrators and editors and things as well. It's so wonderful to have that community and the collaborations help a lot. Me and you have collaborated in in some ways, and this episode is going to go out before our Halloween work goes out, so we can't talk about it in too much detail. But you've hinted towards the fact that you know you come out of uh, other stories retirement every year to do Halloween, and both <laughs> last year, <laughs> last year and this year, you and I are both involved in the other stories Halloween event. And it's interesting, I don't know um, when you reached this point, but for me, this year when I was when I was asked if I, if I might submit something for it, if I would be involved, I had that confidence and thought, you know what, I can deliver a story. I know now that I can deliver a story and there isn't those nerves. Do you yeah. remember the point where that happened for you? Um, so it was a little bit different for me, I think, because in the very, very early stages, when it was just four of us, each writing a story for for one week of podcast. It was kind of me or nobody else. There wasn't like an influx of, you know, dozens and dozens of writers submitting stories. It was kind of like, this is your week, this is your story. So in a way, it's like, oh, it's a weird one. Obviously, the pressure of whether the story is accepted or whether the story is deemed good enough is kind of off. But at the same time, the story needs to be good enough. <laughs> it needs to be good enough because it's going out. No matter what it is, and I think a few times in the a few times in the early, in the early few months, I might have written something, you know, that was probably a little bit like, is this even horror? Is this even sci-fi? Does this even fit the brand? But then I guess we didn't even know what the brand was in those days. It's kind of just fire any old thing out. Oh, I say any old thing. I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, but yeah, we used to just, we used to just. I was just. Sometimes I would just go. I haven't got an idea for this. This is a theme that. I don't think I can write a story for. So I kind of like write a story and then maybe somewhere I go, yeah, and then I had a werewolf in it. Oh, can you believe it? Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> it was a bit like that. Um, but then over, I guess, yeah, over the course of time and over the course of, I don't know, maybe the first year, I think the first year of writing for the other stories, I really did learn a lot because I was write, writing about themes that I had absolutely no you know, if someone said the theme for this month is uh, um, Greek myths, for example. And I'm like, how on earth am I going to write a horror slash science fiction what if story about Greek myths? What on earth am I going to do? And it just really 
I think it really helped me develop that craft even further by kind of really putting me on the spot and making me craft something. Yeah, that 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 was something that, that I find quite difficult to to write about sometimes. But um, yeah, t- it definitely took me a while. And there's even now, as I said, even now there are moments when, obviously, now we've just done another collaboration for Halloween. Uh, I was I can't remember how this was decided, but I think I was told, right, you're doing episode one. <laughs> so, you know, initially there's like the what? <laughs> episode one. I know that we've got like a, a sort of interwoven linking story as well. Um, but I won't obviously go too much into the details of that. But yeah, that pressure kind of really did sort of come back onto me where I had a very vague idea of what I wanted to do. And then suddenly I'm like, gosh, I've got to write a 3,000 word story about this. So, yeah, but I think it keeps you it keeps you motivated and it keeps you on your toes, which is nice to do. And I think you've just got to you just get to a stage where you just have to trust the process. Like you say, you know, there is a, a feeling sometimes when you don't know exactly what you're going to write for a certain theme, because, you know, there's going to be themes that jive with your kind of tastes uh, and there's obvious themes that you know that you're just going to be a big fan of like anything that kind of sounds vaguely sci-fi horror is i'm going to be into if it's like a kind of techie theme like dark web stories i'm going to be into those i can't wait to listen to them but there's other ones like you said that you just don't know exactly what you're going to do but ultimately as you build that confidence you you begin to trust the process like you know I've done yeah. it before. I can do it again. Trust the process, but I, I just trust everybody around me as well. And I really do savor feedback in any form because, you know, obviously when you when you submit something, initially you think, oh, God, what are they going to say? Are they going to say I don't think this is good enough? What are they going to correct me on? You know, all those things. But I kind of savor that now because I respect everybody involved enough that I think, first, thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs> To, to read something I've written, that's a great feeling, isn't it? That's a great feeling, knowing that somebody has sat down with a first draft of something you've written and they've and they've sort of picked through it and given you feedback, uh, positive and negative, I think. But then again, obviously, in terms of negative, it's always, it's always feedback that you can work on. And some of the stuff for this Halloween project gave me ideas that I wouldn't have had if I didn't have that, like, immediate, immediate feedback from everybody, so... It really is great. I like it. Yeah, having other writers around you in a supportive community is so good. Do you think then, because for early works and a beginning writer, getting not necessarily negative feedback and not necessarily harsh criticism, but getting that those sort of notes back uh, can be difficult for some writers. I'm the same as you, actually. I, I love it. I, I love to get criticism and to hear where a story's weaknesses are because I know I can improve that way. But was there ever a point where you were very precious of your writing and you had to work through that or was that always your your approach? No, no, I don't think I've ever been majorly precious. And I think that's kind of gone away even more the more and more I've collaborated. Um most of the time, if, if I'm collaborating with somebody, I would fire something over and obviously you're being nice and polite and British and saying, yeah, I don't mind what you change, change what you want. Oh, I'm not too precious about that. Uh, and it sounds a bit cliche, but I genuinely am not. I'm really open and, and receptive to everything that's sort of suggested in terms of, yeah, character. There might be a couple of things I might want to dig my heels on where like this is really key to the story. But other than that, I just I think having all that feedback and those collaborators like I think I had maybe two or three rounds of different um, amends and changes to my Halloween story and everything that I had come back I was like yeah that's a really good idea or yeah I never thought of that or that sounds way better which is which is lovely it's a great it's a great thing to have access to because you know so many people will write and they won't have access to that they won't have access to a, a sort of a team or or a community of people who will take the time to read your stuff and then take the time to to give you to give you feedback as well like Andy Conduit Turner has done a great job of sort of bringing everybody together on this as well and keeping everyone keeping everyone motivated and whip smart 
Yeah, Andy's been great. Andy actually gave me a bit of feedback when he heard my pitch for my story for this year's Halloween. And uh, it was a substantial, you know, it, it substantially changed my whole approach to the story. But as soon as he said it, the light bulb went off on over my head and I just thought, man, that's perfect. Yeah. That is exactly what this story needs. Um, yeah, he's really he's really done well and I'm excited for people to hear it. That's why. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Me too. Um, I think that's why I'd recommend collaborating with a writer or other writers on something. Um, doesn't have to be like a major, major project. You know, if you're if you're a writer of novels um, and you write alone, mainly, you know, team up with somebody to write something, team up with somebody to write a short story, a novella or, you know, anything, because I think it's really good to be able to. I think it helps your writing as well when you're kind of feeding back for on somebody else's work i think it's a great tool yeah so one of the things that i noticed when we first collaborated together uh, on the nest last year for halloween on the other stories also is you make your own covers now i have a lot of questions around this because that is a rare thing for a writer who makes their own covers and the covers are fantastic like sometimes you'll hear about writers making their own covers and they're you, not dude. quite so successful but one of the things before we talk just about that one of the things that i remember when we wrote the nest before we'd really gotten too far into the actual writing process i feel like you had already developed the cover the cover existed i think before the the story did yeah, is that, I think, is we, that your I think we had. Yeah, I think we had the basic idea, synopsis, and the. Yes, sorry. Yeah, we definitely had the, the, the idea. We yeah, definitely had that, didn't we? Um, and I think we had an illustration as well. An illustration. That's correct. Uh, which was done yeah. by which was done by Luke Spooner, who does all the other stories, thumbnails now. And I think yeah, so I think we had an illustration, and I think I just finished reading uh, my best friend's Exorcism. Uh, by Grady Hendrix, which a f uh, some versions of that cover are are like this old school VHS style. And the, I think the first thing I did, as soon as I knew a new project was coming up, <laughs> and we kind of agreed it was going to be set in the eighties, I was like, I got to try my hand at that. I've really got to try my hand at that. <laughs> and I think that was that kind of for me, the visual, the developing visuals and covers and stuff. In the very early stage of a story, they kind of go side by side for me. I think as soon as I start developing the visuals, I kind of really start to have an idea of the tone and the direction of something I'm writing. So I'm very, very much, very much a visual person when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah, that was exactly what what I was leading up to asking was: Is that just part of your process for all your uh, books and? maybe longer works i guess i don't i wouldn't imagine you'd do that for short stories as well or maybe you do do you always start with a cover or an image when you start writing yeah, something new i think so not so much i'd say not so much for short stories but for a lot of bigger projects something visual so my day job is 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 graphic design um i study graphic design as well um a long time before i decided i wanted to write so that has kind of always gone side by side is that I've always kind of like been key to, it was almost like getting something down visually gave me that, oomph, gave me that nudge again to, to go and start writing something. It was like, okay, right. I, I can understand the, as I said, the tone from this image and, uh, it kind of, yeah, pushed me to, to go and start writing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, as I say, it's a very rare thing for a writer who also makes their own cover so successfully. So I'm not just to, tie this back to uh, our listeners i'm not going to suggest that anyone tries making their own covers but as someone who does make covers do you have any thoughts as someone who bridges both the the writing side and the the cover designer side any tips on how an author should approach the the des cover design process with their designer how they should speak to them any thoughts that they should have yeah i think a good jumping off point is always showing the designer you know examples of book covers you like try and keep it relevant to your genre i'd say if you're going to show the book covers because sometimes you know if you're if you're a horror writer and somebody shows you a 
the front cover of a Argos catalog. <laughs> they don't even know what that came into my head. I don't know if they exist anymore, do they? The Argos no, they, catalogs? They have They've stopped. all been pulped. They've all they been have. pulped. That's what's happened. It was big news earlier this year. Argos catalogs are no more. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> devastated. Absolutely devastated. Um, yeah, get things, get as many visual aids together. Um, I think when... I think a lot of people are worried about that because they don't want to show a designer something that the designer then goes, well, I'm just going to do that then. I'm just going to rip that off, which probably some designers would, but hopefully not the majority of them. Um, but yeah, as many visual aids as possible, of covers you like, of styles you like, you know, some cool bit of typography you've seen or anything like that. But I guess also just try and have, um, try and have some respect i was going to say respect i don't know if that's the right that's the right word but uh for the designer's vision as well as you as you would expect somebody to have respect on your uh writing capability you know you're the writer so that's your job and then i guess treat the designer in the same sort of way as well yeah, which is weird i've got i've obviously got an internal monologue going on there between designer and writer kind of always fighting it out <laughs> at any one time well yeah that's why i kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on it because you do bridge both uh, so well i guess the same sort of thing as in terms of how you would approach any collaboration i'd say uh just yeah just have faith in in their ability and now have faith in yours and then just communicate just communicate as best as possible because i think sometimes when people brief in design they're like oh sorry i've got another change and oh sorry i don't want this i don't want that it's like that's absolutely fine it's you, it's got to be perfect. I want it to be perfect for you. Again, this is still my monologue going in, just going, oh, Ben, is this good enough? Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, I'm not so sure. <laughs> God, come here. Yeah, sick of you. <laughs> no, it's, it's There's a little like, insight. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's exactly where great minds think alike. Um, Okay, so one of the other things I've written a note here, this is a, a little bit of a change of tact away from covers, um, but it's another thing, ladies and gentlemen, that Ben is very good at, and that is social media, right? So a lot of people struggle with this. I, to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the Hawk and Cleaver social channels, you, you manage those, right? You're kind of the man behind the whole social media presence for Hawk and Cleaver, right? Which is fairly substantial. Yes. Yes. And yeah, yeah. So pretty much everything. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, trying to build a bit more of an audience on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, just trying to keep everything fairly consistent across those platforms. How did that happen? I don't want to get too stuck in, in the history of, uh, of Hawk and Cleaver, but I'm just interested. What singled you out as the as the man to do that particular task because everyone kind of in the early days as you said you know the everyone had their their thing that they were working on in Hawk and Cleaver and you very much became amongst other things but you are the social media guy and still are today was that intentional um I think maybe I just volunteered I think I'd been quite up to I think I'd been quite up together on my social media presence even at that stage uh, in terms of like posting every day and uh, trying not to annoy people, uh, <laughs> not posting the same sort of stuff. <laughs> and I'm quite meticulous with that. And I think I've always applied it to other channels as well. And, the, you know, stuff when I was in bands like years ago, it was always me who did all the social media. Because I think you either you either want to have social media presence or you don't. And I think if you don't, there's no way of then turning it on. I think it's quite, I think it's quite tough. So I think everybody at Hawk and Cleaver is kind of really good at something. Like I'm not too good at the the nitty gritty, the details, the finances, all stuff like that. Luckily, we've got some people who are. <laughs> so I think I'm kind of happy that I've got something that I can bring to the table that I can kind of. So, yeah, I'm absolutely I, I like uh, managing the social channels. I like interacting with people. And it's just something that really does take. With social media, I think it does take a lot. It's a long time for things to grow. And I just like seeing it kind of happen, seeing it unfold, seeing the fact that, you know, we've hit however many followers on this and that. And not that I find that really, really important, but I think it's still nice to see that natural growth happen over time. There uh, might. Yeah. I, go on. Sorry. 
Oh, sorry, I, I, I talked over you there. There might not be an answer to this, but do you see writers, authors, do you see them making any very obvious and avoidable mistakes on social media as someone who kind of knows what they're doing? Oh, well, you say that, but now I'm thinking of all the f- mistakes I probably make on my personal <laughs> on, my, <laughs> on, my, on my personal accounts. Um, but in terms of like Hawk and Cleaver account, it's hard to say, really. I don't see anyone out there doing anything that I would consider real bad because, you know, even there's some people are really notorious on social media and it doesn't seem to affect their, you know, <laughs> as long as you're not as long as you're not hateful. <laughs> As long as you're not bringing hate into it or you're not having a go at minorities in any form, um, just being a bigot or a fascist, just don't do that stuff. That's pr- that. I mean, that is pretty much just it. I think as long as you're not that, as long as you're kind, considerate and just positive, you know, I mean, I definitely like a social media rant occasionally, but I think everything I share on Hawk and Cleaver channels has always got a positive vibe to it we're like hey look at this thing, cool thing we're doing oh can't wait for this check out this you know it's all very and i don't, try not to try not to flood social media channels as well i try to limit things like instagram and facebook to just a single post a day maybe two if i'm feeling extra special uh, <laughs> and even with twitter you know i try not to overload things and i also try not to have my personal opinion come across too much in a lot of this stuff mm. i try to keep it fairly neutral in terms of that um and i keep all the opinionated stuff just for my personal profile because then you know it's easy enough for somebody to dislike what i'm saying and then unfollow me that's fine but that's not really detrimental to hawk and cleaver as such whereas if i was pushing an agenda i guess on hawk and cleaver channels then people might be more likely to unfollow and then you know that's that but yeah have a bit of freedom with it i think um but yeah i think pos- the positive nature of things is the best i try not to i mean i never would on hawk and cleaver channels but i really do try on my personal channels as well not to moan about too much uh, <laughs> it's usually just political stuff that i kind of have a little moan about but i think almost always i'm sharing stuff that i love and to just strike up a conversation with other people who are like-minded about this cool stuff. And I think social media could do with a lot more of that. And I guess I'm just trying to bring that into the Hawk and Cleaver voice as much as possible. Yeah, that's real. That's, that's words to live by, really. Just just be positive. Don't be a dick. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's not difficult. Do you ever get... Um... Because I recently had to take a fairly major break from social media and I'm still not posting all that frequently at the moment. But do you ever just get burnt out with it? Has that ever happened? Have you ever had to take a step back? Especially I'm thinking things like Twitter can sometimes feel quite toxic uh, occasionally. But I guess maybe it's just where you focus your attention. I guess if you're uh, there's so much positivity like you say, if you're bringing positivity out there, you know, I've never seen anything toxic from the Hawk and Cleaver channels or you or any of the people that I, I follow. It's always, you, you wait know... to see what I've got planned to post tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm I'm it's always the, it's always, you know, beyond that kind of bubble that I, that I live in, but still you, you, you see it, you catch glimpses of it and it can get you down. Is that something you ever oh, yeah, have struggled with? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've struggled fairly you know occasionally with that and uh it's difficult i don't know what the answer is to that really because i find myself you know reading stuff your blood boiling and sure step away from the screen i don't tend to enforce like a social media ban upon myself i don't say right don't look at anything for two days or a week or you know anything like that i just think come back to it when you're ready and i don't think i overdo it even though i post a lot of stuff stuff on social media i don't do all that much scrolling okay i don't think i say that but then <laughs> i'm just trying i'm just I'm trying to come to terms with that in my head uh, <laughs> and I think i'm definitely guilty of scrolling a lot yeah yeah i mean it could be better you know um i think it's quite easy to curate your feeds so that you see a lot of stuff that makes you feel good 
obviously then you're in trouble of being in an echo chamber and you know if anytime you fire something out there you know people are gonna be like yeah i agree couldn't have said it better yeah and you're like yeah come on i am but, amazing uh, i am amazing <laughs> look at me i am the king but uh <laughs> At the same time, I saw someone recently, you know, sort of say, right, oh, I'm sick of I'm sick of Instagram and all you see is people dancing to TikTok videos and all this stuff. And I was thinking, OK, that's fine. It's perfectly with, you're perfectly within your rights to dislike that. But it's fairly easy to not be seeing any more of that. So one key thing for especially for creatives is interaction. So likes, comments, retweets, uh, I think even on Instagram, like when you save posts, it kind of helps as well. It helps creatives. It helps the algorithm sort of, it helps you appear on other people's feeds more often. I think if you really are getting burnt out by social media and you are only getting burnt out by what you see, just go out there and start liking, commenting and interacting with stuff you love. And it won't take long for your feeds to be mainly full of stuff you love. And uh, I mean, that can be quite addictive, obviously. Then you'd like, oh, God, get some more of that. Go get some more of them likes. Go get, <laughs> go, go, go comment on that. Yeah. But I found it's a good way for me, at least, to not hate social media. Like, I can't remember the last time, you know, I went, God, what am I seeing that on my feed? Jesus. Because I think I've just over time just managed to curate it enough. And obviously, social media isn't all good. I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of poison out there, but. I think you just do your best to avoid it and do your best to kind of let it wash over you as well. And again, probably not the greatest advice, but as no. a as as a creative, I think you kind of just want to you kind of want to be as positive as you can on these things. And then you you put positivity out, positivity out there, and positivity will mm. hopefully come back to you except that one person who's always <laughs> there's always that one, isn't there? There's always that one person who pops up only to disagree. There always is. No, I think that's great. I think that's great advice. I'm feeling kind of pumped up about social media again now. You've got me, you've got yeah, me feeling I mean, good about the world. I, I tend to, I wouldn't say so much about it online, but I definitely say a lot to people in person, especially when they complain about social media to me. Like, for ex a great example is, oh, I've, dele I've deleted said app because said app is full of whatever. Mm. Um, I tend to say, well, of course that's fine, but it is pretty straightforward to. It's easier said than done, but the block, the remove, the mute buttons are, and you don't have to do it forever. You know, if you feel like you need a break from that person, or not even just person, but brand or whatever, uh, mm. use those buttons as much as you like. There's no limit on how many times you can block somebody. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic advice. I actually think there's a lot of actionable stuff in there. I didn't know that saving a post on Instagram is good for the algorithm. That's really interesting to learn. Well, I only I only saw this shared fairly recently. I'll try and hunt it down because I think I saw it shared on Instagram. But it's basically just all of the 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 comments, the like, but the like button, and the and the, even the saving of the post. It all adds to that algorithm like if you go onto the explore tab on instagram which i don't do very often but i remember it being full of stuff where i was like how has this made it onto my explore tab and now when i look at it i'm like oh my god there's so much cool stuff and following so many different people and and you know clothing brands and horror fans it knows me so well it yeah. knows me so well almost almost too well yeah, it's a little bit nerve wracking. I got to admit when I opened mine as well. Um, we are coming up on on uh, time, and I, I want to be respectful of your time. But there's one, there's actually a couple of notes that I've made, and it's always the way. Whenever I sit down with someone, I make so many notes, and we can never get to it all in the in the time that's allocated. But we, we've spoken, obviously. Oh goodness, we haven't spoken about your comic book, uh, El Marvel, which I really want. We're going to have to have a follow-up call at some point. It's going to have to happen. <laughs> but just one of the things I wanted to talk about, because I believe this is one of your current projects just now, aside from uh, the, the Halloween event happening over in the podcast that we've spoken about, is you've also dabbled in some non-fiction as well as some fiction writing. You have um, a book called My Dad Getting Things Slightly Wrong, which I 
really like. <laughs> I just wanted. I know it's. I know it probably seems a little bit weird that I bring this up, but I, I was wondering if you could just um, uh, tell our listeners what that book is and what how it came about. Yeah. So um, my dad just says a lot of really crazy, bizarre, mad things that like I have sometimes have to take a second to like unpack the layers of stuff he's either got wrong, misremembered, or mispronounced before I can understand what he quite mean means. And uh, I think it started off as I used to just tell my friends about stuff that my dad said. And, you know, people would be cracking up, and then it would kind of, like, move on to me going, oh, God, I've got so many of these. So I started tweeting them. Um, and I would start every tweet with my dad. So when I realized I'd got a hell of a lot, all I had to do was go onto Twitter search my username and then my dad and then i had you know dozens of of these and it is, it is a very short book um <laughs> you know there's not it's not it's probably like 40 pages long with a quote every four every page sorry uh, but when i realized i had so many of these i was like ah i kind of need to get it out there and i think it was a kind of a, like a bit of a weird birthday gift for him when I first published it, I think I first published it just on Kindle. It is on paperback. It is in little paperbacks now. Um, but yeah, before it was just like a little birthday gift. I was like, all right, Dad, uh, I know I'll give you some. I know I'll give you a lot of uh, a lot of jip every day because I do. I can't let him say anything without me going. Hang on, <laughs> come on, explain yourself. Uh, so I said, okay, so I've kind of got you a bit of a gift, and I've just we I've published this book, and I've made it like a. It's me and him who've written it rather than being me writing it about him. I've made it like me and him because, you know, he's given he's given me most of the content. Uh, yeah. And it was just a really fun way of sort of getting all these anecdotes and little stories about my dad down into into one into one place for me to always look back on fondly and still baffled, still baffles me <laughs> by the day. But since it's been published, he's still firing them out. <laughs> so I'm almost like, okay, Dad, you need to slow down because, you know, book two is going to arrive any minute now if you keep <laughs> on coming. And that's what I love. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, I thought that it was a birthday gift, and I'm glad you said that because that's kind of what I was angling for and the reason for bringing it up. Because I just love the idea that so often we're thinking about writing to market or trying to get as many readers as possible for our books, but sometimes it's an entirely valid approach to write a book for just one person and it to be lovely. Yeah. Like I love the fact that you made that for, obviously it's available to everyone, but I love the fact that you made it for his birthday. And I think that's fantastic, but I didn't realize that it was from, or I didn't realize exactly how you'd written it. So I love the fact as well that you've also given us a fantastic example of repurposing content because you just went back into your Twitter feed, did a yeah. search, and immediately you had the manuscript for your book, essentially. I love that. Yeah, but that was kind of what I'd do. If I was, if I was telling friends about them, you know, friends would go, oh, my God, have you got any more? <laughs> you know, it was, it was a bit more like Dave Chappelle. You got any more of those uh, dad, <laughs> dad getting things wrong quotes? Uh <laughs> And I was like, I think I've tweet, I've definitely tweeted some. And then, I, as I said, I just searched my name and and my dad, and they they were all there. And I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. Some of us have just clicked one day. Where I was like, I should probably write these into into a little a little book. But yeah, even now, my dad says, and it like every time I see him, he kind of goes, any more of our books sold? <laughs> as if he thinks I've got like a like a stall with all these books lined up. And I say like, Dad, honestly, I don't know. It's one of those things. It was such a. It was so nice to write something put it out there and kind of just let it let it be i wasn't sh i wasn't really too bothered about how many people read it like i still now i'll get sometimes i get a photo on instagram from like a school friend or like someone i don't really know very well but kind of do and they've got like a copy of the book and i'm a bit like that's insane i hope you enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful um so we are really getting close. So I've only got a couple of questions, a couple of topics that I want to ask before we get to the very exciting quick fire round, which I know you're excited about. Um, yes. But I think I was just going to ask, you know, what you were working on just now, because obviously there's so much that you've done. Uh, there's so many notes I've got here. We haven't even got to them uh, that, you, that you're up to. But I, I believe, and I don't want to tee you up because you might be working on something else right now. Uh, I believe that you're working on another nonfiction book 
for the horror hangout podcast is that is that your current project do you have anything else on the on your plate at the moment uh that's the big one i think that's the big one and it was kind of something that me and luke had been discussing on and off probably over the last couple of years because i think the podcast is coming up to i think it's in its third year i think like early next year we'll be going into the fourth year so there's a lot a lot of podcast content out there i think i worked out recently to be over seven days worth of horror hangout horror movie discussion episodes so there's a lot of good stuff you know but once you come out of a hour and a half recording session you're a bit dazed confused you can't really remember anything you're like there were definitely some funny parts in there but uh, i can't remember any of it so i thought i'll go back and listen and it's been a long process because obviously <laughs> i think i've maybe i think i've maybe like 50 episodes in Go back and listen and cherry pick some of the some of the hot takes from either <laughs> of us and kind of make it into a, a a book about horror movies, but one that's a little bit tongue in cheek, a little bit silly. And it's been really fun, you know, putting everything together. Um, it's kind of like half like reviews of horror movies and opinions on horror movies. Also, and there's a lot of like trivia in there as well. Um, and I've been trying to draw a like a vhs cover of each horror movie to go alongside each chapter so it's kind of like a bit a bit of both it's been writing and illustrating but kind of at the same time not exact not at the exact same time that would be silly but (laughs) but so yeah it's been a fun project uh it's probably a little way off now hopefully 2021 i'd say for 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 release but luke i'm, I'm gonna write some chapters luke's gonna write some chapters andy as well um is gonna write some chapters gonna really concentrate on good and bad films i think because sometimes the bad film episodes are the ones when you listen to an episode and it's just us loving the shining it's a bit like i'm not getting anything from this <laughs> yeah i don't want to put yeah. any of this in a book but when it's <laughs> us watching uh i don't know ua balls alone in the dark <laughs> Ball, whatever you say his name that is when the the good content comes through so yeah again similar similar to the book my dad's the book i wrote about my dad it's kind of like dipping back into into old content and repurposing it um as something as something else not not just just for the sake of it but just because i feel like it would be a a good thing to to get out there yeah, I mean, just speaking as a fan of the horror hangout, uh, I'm really looking forward to reading it. Uh, um, it's uh, it's such a great podcast. The dynamic you and Luke have, going back all the way to that early storytelling podcast thing, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't exist if that didn't exist. So I'm happy that it does because it's it's probably one of my top played podcasts. Quite honestly, I'm not just saying that. Great to hear, man. That's uh, great to a, hear. It's a lot of fun. Needs to get you back on as well. You've not been on it for a little while. Invasion yeah. of the Body Snatchers, I think, was the last episode you were on. Yeah, that was that was the one and only. I'll, I'm I'm up for it any time. Whenever you've got a, a something coming up, yeah. go for it. Um, but that sounds great. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. And the if anyone wants to see the covers that you've been drawing, because the covers are great too. You've been posting all of them on social media as you go along, which is a nice little way to tease the the book and show your work as you're going along. Because obviously, as you said, it's being written. It's probably not expected to 2021 but already people on socials are getting excited just about these illustrations i've seen a couple of people tweeting you asking for t-shirts and things like that which is maybe not something you originally expected when you were doing it that must be lovely yeah yeah of course great as i said again great to have anybody interacting with something you've made or created in some way it's always always great to have people's feedback and have people getting excited about stuff so that's a great feeling um yeah so who knows what's going to happen i kind of initially was like i'm going to draw 100 and then i think i had a bit of a lag around about 25 but i think i'm on like 60 or 70 now so wow on the home straight yeah definitely all right well um before i get to my final question we have one patreon question from our supporters i think you may recognize this name uh Daniel Wilcox asks, Oh, <laughs> oh, Dan. How has Ben's writing process changed for short stories since the launch of the other stories? We obviously talked about 
uh, that's the end of his question. But we obviously talked about your early short stories uh, in the other stories. When you sit down now, has your writing process changed? You were talking earlier about how Dan would sometimes chase you for a story uh, when the theme was coming up and you were you said that it's that you were writing last minute is that still like the case his nowadays question, his question feels like he's chasing me for a story <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, i don't feel i've got any outstanding dan have i <laughs> let me just check i'm not sure uh, <laughs> um i guess it has because as i said i don't write as much for the other stories Whereas I used to write every month for a new theme, it felt like there was a lot of pressure. Sometimes it felt like I was plucking something out of nothing. I kind of might have had a very vague idea. How can I make this relevant? Whereas with something like coming out of, as you called it, other stories, semi-retirement, or maybe even full retirement, uh, <laughs> to suddenly just write a story for the Halloween stuff, um, it just felt like I had a lot more time to to plan and really craft an idea, I guess. Um I think that's probably the way I work best. So I would say less pressure on myself, less fear of Daniel Wilcox. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it's changed. Um, and it feels just something special about it, you know, not having written all year for the other stories. Obviously, I've written stuff, but just not for the other stories. Not having written all year. It feels kind of special. It kind of feels like a, a little guest appearance coming out, <laughs> coming out on stage. With uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's you know back, I mean? ladies and gentlemen. He's back, just like a blo- a bloated Axl Rose when he came out on stage of ACDC. And like, what's he doing here? What's he doing here? He can't be here. <laughs> oh, I am. I'm here. And this is how would the hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're much more well received than uh, a bloated Axl Rose, but there we go. That's maybe that's just me talking. Okay, oh, one of the questions are my. F- well, yeah, indeed. Uh, time will tell. The question we ask everyone, the last one before our quick fire round. Um, maybe we covered this. We sometimes do in the course of the conversation, but it's a very simple one. Why, Ben, do you write? Oh, that is a good, that's a simple, but a good question. It's a difficult one. Why do I write? I just love... This, this is a hard question. This sounds so simple, but it's good. I love uh, building worlds. I guess that's it. Is that, you know, majority of my leisure time, my free time, I spend in the company of some of some characters created by somebody else in some other world. Uh, huge video game fan, play a lot of games, uh, huge movie fan, try and watch like as many movies as I can, at least one a day. So, I, I've really enjoyed doing that and I kind of really wanted to not just create that for myself but also create worlds that perhaps other people could enjoy and exist in as well um, and I got some sick satisfaction out of that I guess uh, but yeah I think that's what keeps me going keeps me coming back for it is that I like creating worlds sometimes I'll watch a film or I'll play a game and I'll say this is cool but imagine this and that's when you know it's great to be able to bring those things to life because most of the time it might just be a fleeting thought or a passing, you know, a passing scene in your head where you kind of, um, but yeah, to be to have a chance to be able to bring some of those things to life is, uh, is very exciting. That's an excellent answer to a, a deceptively tricky question. Um, very, very, very tricky. So are you ready for our quick fire round? This is it. We've made it to the end. Here we I go. told you I'm I'm, get, I'm, it's, I'm very gentle with you. This is going to be <laughs> You're no, being very gentle. no problem at all. You're not going to have any issues at all with this. Are you ready? You can pass, but honestly, I don't think you'll need to if you need okay. to. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Question one. What book are you currently reading? Um, so I'm currently reading uh, The League of, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, by Alan Moore. Well, is that a book? That's comics. I'm reading volume one and volume two. I'll accept that. Great books. Uh, I've got Tempest lined up to read myself quite soon, but I haven't got to it yet. Absolutely. Question two. Are you a cat or a dog person? I'm a dog person. Question three. Twitter or Instagram? Oh, Instagram. Lo- love the visuals. Question four. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, I had peanut butter on toast. 
Nice. Fancy. Question five. What's your favourite book cover that is not one of your own? Oh, uh, the one I mentioned before, my best friend's exorcism, Grady Hendrix, the one that I kind of wanted to kind of rip off. <laughs> <laughs> Question six. What's the best writing that you've seen in a video game? Oh, maybe The Last of Us Part 2 oh, and Part 1. Oh. Death Stranded's up there as well. Hideo Kojima. Hi- uh, okay, Hideo Kojima, Metal Gear Solid. That's it. Sorry. Come back. There was four answers, but I liked them all. Apart from Death Stranding, <laughs> which I haven't played yet. <laughs> um, question seven. What's your favorite song to sing in the shower? Uh, we Care A Lot, Faith No More. Nice. Question eight. What Thank is you. the perfect horror movie for a first date? Oh, perfect horror movie for a first date exorcist because a crucifix goes in unknown places and if they can't handle that then they they ain't worth my time (laughs) question nine are you an early bird or a night owl a night owl question 10 what was the first games console you ever owned oh um myself a a sega mega drive but i think my dad had like a commodore 64 which i played Oh, very nice. And a little bonus one, question 11. Where can our listeners find out more about you and all that you're working on? Any websites or social media handles? Yeah, so it's got to be... So my personal social media handles are all, across the board, Twitter, Instagram, at Ben underscore Errington, or, of course, the Hawk and Cleaver stuff, at Hawk and Cleaver, which is the same on Twitter and Instagram as well. I'll be all over both of them like a horrible rash fantastic and all those links ladies and gentlemen will be in the show notes ben that's us thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it thanks for having me that was a hell of a lot of fun and great to talk about some stuff great to talk about some stuff that i've probably not spoken about before in great depth in great uh depth so thank you very much for listening I'm glad to surprise you with that early uh trip down memory lane so yeah thanks for listening everyone Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Tune in next week when Holly will be joined by Julia Scott. Don't forget that you can catch up on the entire backlist of Great Writer Share episodes, plus a ton of behind-the-scenes content, early access to episodes, our Slack group, monthly Q&As with me and the other hosts, and even one-to-one coaching from Dan by joining our Patreon from as little as $1 a month. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash greatwritershare for all the details. Until next time. <laughs>